Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to this time of worship at Woodlawn United Methodist Church. We are glad that you have joined us, either here in person or those who are joining us virtually this morning or those who may be listening to the service later in the week. There are a few announcements I want to draw to your attention uh, before we set our hearts towards worship. The first is a reminder that today is our covered dish lunch. Everyone is invited to stay and feast and eat and fellowship with one another. This is one of our most uh, cherished and I may say, dare say sacred traditions at Woodlawn that we gather together to feast and fellowship together. So stay and eat with us. Uh, also, you may be surprised to see, I was, that uh, the Easter season is upon us and that means there are certain events coming up like our Easter egg hunt is this coming Saturday. Uh, I know, I can't believe it's here already, but there is there are lots of spaces for volunteers. We need you to sign up to help. Thanks to everyone who has already brought candy and prizes to stuff into the eggs. Uh, but there's a sign up sheet. If you have any questions about it, ask Emily, ask Kenny. But we're excited about sharing and celebrating our Easter egg hunt this coming Saturday. Also, that means that Easter is right around the corner for us, and Holy Week begins. Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Come and join us throughout that Holy Week as we prepare and we celebrate the season of Easter. Uh, as a part of that, we have a shared service. Uh, that this year will be at Avondale United Methodist Church on Good Friday. Good Friday service will be March 29th, 6.30 p.m. Avondale United Methodist Church. We ask you to join us for all of the events uh, upcoming so that we might fellowship, that we might worship, and we might celebrate God's presence with us. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
loving God, we gather here in this season of reflection as new life begins to blossom all around us. The rain falls, the sun nourishes, and life emerges. We are here to celebrate your love and presence. We are here to receive nourishment and food for the journey. May new life take root in us. May it blossom and grow, so that our words and our actions might bear fruit and welcome God's kingdom in this place and outside these walls. Amen.
scripture today is from John 12. Interestingly enough, it comes after the procession that we call Palm Sunday, um, which we'll celebrate next week. This is how the lectionary is. Um, and next week, we will read that scripture. And if it's decent weather, we'll start out on the porch and, and process in. Um, so we invite you to um, join us out there as we begin our service next week. So John chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. I invite you to stand as you're able. Now there were some Greeks among those who went to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said it was an angel who had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. So, I want to show you something. You may have seen them before. I love the, I know it's not spring yet, I love these late days of winter in the south. Um, because of all the, the colorful blooms that are coming up. And um, I love the daffodils and the tulips. I love the daffodils that come up on our little tree right over there. I'm not sure why we don't have daffodils on this side. Um, there's a yard on my street that has these bright red tulips um, right now that are just beautiful. And my yard will never have daffodils or tulips because I never remember to plant these in the fall, which is when you have to plant daffodils and tulips to get them to grow now. And I, I'm always busy with other things like the leaves on the trees and what color they are and that they're going to fall and I'm going to have to rake them up. <laughs> I'm never thinking about these kind of bulbs during the fall. And I think that they're pretty amazing. So I was inspired this week to go, these aren't to look for daffodil bulbs. I mean, that would be really way ahead of these work. These are gladiola bulbs, and I can um, plant them this week, and they'll come up in the summer. I can, I can handle that <laughs> a little bit. I think that these bulbs, which just, they don't look like anything. I want you to see them because they're, they're just funny looking. They're not colorful, but they're amazing. I mean, seeds and bulbs are amazing. They, I guess maybe because they're so little and we know that they're going to grow into something that's complex and, and big with root systems and chlorophyll and the ability to take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen, which we need. But 
But the thing about bulbs, besides knowing when to plant them, is that we have to plant them. We have to do something with them before they will change and grow. I can't just them now. I can't just hold them in my hand like a wish and, and hope that something will happen. Of course, we all know that they have to be put into the ground, buried, if you will. I have bought bolts before and forgotten them. Um, and, and maybe I will forget these. They may stay in here for the next six months. Who knows? But if they do, you might have like a green stem come out of one, you know, like an onion that has been on your counter too long. Or they will just rot and they'll just be a shell that disintegrates. There'll be nothing if we don't put them into the ground. And that's where we pick up Jesus's metaphor of the grain, of the, the seed that has to go into the ground. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So this whole passage that we read is about the time drawing near to Jesus' death. And, and this talks about how Jesus knew he would die. He knew that his actions stepped outside the status quo and that his words brought new meaning to the law and his sense of justice was for those usually on the outside of society, those who had been lost or forgotten. And all these things wrapped up in a man that some were calling the Son of God, the Messiah, all of this had consequences, consequences that would lead to punishment and death. And it was a violent death, for sure. Like the means of crucifixion is horrible, it is atrocious, and not to mention that, that Jesus suffered so much abuse before being put on the cross. Many times when we talk about the cross, we, we talk about the blood that Jesus shed, which happened to be sure, but Jesus didn't bleed to death. He suffocated. Those who were executed were put in a position where they could not draw their breath. Jesus' breath was taken from him. Another thing that we sometimes say when we talk about the cross is that God made this happen. Well, how can we interpret this, this, this Messiah in that way? Now, I'm, I hear what the scripture says and, and, and that it talks about God being glorified coming to this time. But Jesus went through his life healing, building peace, bringing life to people. What sense does it make for a violent death to bring glory to God? I think that's where we have to go back to the grain of wheat. The grain only becomes wheat that's able to be multiplied into many plants when it is first buried under the ground, and then tended with soil and nutrients and sunshine and water and, and so forth. I mean, if you've had a garden or you've lived or worked on a farm or you took middle school science, you know this, that a seed goes into the ground, it needs all these things to do their thing so that growth can occur, for roots to develop, and then a stem and leaves, branches, vines, fruit, whatever the variety, it becomes more than what it was. It becomes more than just something that we can hold with two fingers. In case of the wheat, it becomes something more useful and beautiful and amazing than just the single grain, this the seed that we begin with. Jesus's life had to be ended for him to come back to be 
a more meaningful, beautiful, amazing Savior. And that's where the glory lies. Not in the violence. And certainly not in violence created by God. So I can't say that God killed Jesus or took his breath. Humans killed Jesus. People who believe that violence can solve problems. And sometimes we think that is the best way of solving our problems. God uses the death of Jesus to show God's power through the hope, the second chances, the resurrection. And we pause at the cross because it is an essential part of who Jesus is. Our Savior who risks everything to live in God's power and teach us how to live. His way of living led to death. He threatened others with his authority. We've talked about this for the past couple of weeks. In the temple courts, in the towns and villages where he healed and taught, he included those who were usually ignored, freeing them from what oppresses, and he loved everyone. He loved even the people who criticized him. His compassion and power baffled people. It even ticked off some who thought that he had too much compassion or too much power. And Jesus understands that his being, that his his behavior, his way has consequences and it will lead to death. And then I also believe that Jesus knows that this will not be the end. The cross is not the end. His burial in the tomb leads to new life. His death is only part of what it means to be Savior, to be the Christ. Resurrection can only happen after death occurs. And that's when God is fully glorified when Jesus is lifted from the earth. And that's the part we want to get to. I mean, we want to get to the rising up. We want to get to the beautiful flowers and the yummy fruit. We want to get to what feels good. But we can't quite just run there. And I think that's kind of why we have Lent to slow us down to think about what needs to die, what needs to be buried, so that Jesus' power of resurrection can come into our lives. Again and again, God reforms us. What do you need to put to death or to give up so that you can bloom? And I don't mean this in a violent way. I really mean it like attending a garden. Do you need to put something to rest? Even if that means put it in a deep hole and cover it up so that it can become something else. A habit or the way you spend your time or money or something that becomes selfishness to you. Maybe the way you treat your body or the need to control not just yourself, but everything and everybody around you. I've been working on burying some intentions, um, intentions that are like a wish I might just hold in my hand, like that bowl a minute ago. But when I add to that people keeping me accountable, praying for me, um, a desire to know more of God and to make time and space to feel the Spirit. I get to a place where I'm tending the garden with God for growth. Maybe some of that resonates with you. Maybe you can name something that needs to die or that you let go of so that it can 
be raised and grow to reflect God's meaning, beauty, and amazement. Um, religious professor Phyllis Tickle, I think that's a funny name, her name's Phyllis Tickle, she has a book called How Christianity is Changing and Why. And she asserts that every 500 years, we go through a time of reformation in the church. And, and history will show you that. And she thinks, and I'm with her, that we're in one of those times right now. She calls it a giant rummage sale where cultural and religious practices are being reconsidered and some are brought in and some are tossed out and it's all just rethought. Again and again, God reforms us individually and as the church. And we can't be fearful of what needs to be buried because God works for growth and beauty. God's glory is seen in what rises, what is resurrected. And God's glory is seen that the rising and the resurrection happen. They're not just possible, they happen. And our world would be so different if we all could just more easily let go, bury, plant, and then have faith that God is doing something. Something that will be glorious. May it be so. Our hymn of reflection is Have Thy Own Way in the morning. Number 382. I invite you to stay in this.
bless those who make decisions about how to spend them, and bless those who receive what we freely give.
appointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set up liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always by the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this each time you drink it in remembrance of me. When the supper... And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast in his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever.
eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. We thank you for the grain of wheat that grew and made this bread. For the seeds that were planted that became vines and grapes that gave us what is in this cup. We give you thanks for what you do even when we cannot see it. May we go in the name of Jesus Christ to give ourselves for others. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is number 338. We're invited to stand in body or in spirit as we sing together. So we're thankful for everybody 
and um, I want to have a blessing for our meal and a blessing for our day. Gracious and loving God, I want to give you thanks for everybody here and for all we have done to bring ourselves to you and for each other today and bless us as we go forth in this day to be a blessing to others. Um, thank you for the food that has been made and brought and that we will enjoy today. Um, may it all nourish us um, as you have so nourished us to be a blessing to the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.